African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Robert A. Williams, the governing officer of the Sports Foundation and president of the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. Bob, glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Brown. Always a pleasure to be in your company. The governing officer of the Sports Foundation. The Sports Foundation was founded 34 years ago, a dream of you. And tell us what has happened in those 34 years. Well, as you say, a dream of mine, but I must say that I, I credit a former professor of mine at New York mm -hmm. University, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, to let me see how I could uh, lend my talents mm -hmm. to my community after I graduated from college. And my, uh, you know, as you know, I went to play b uh, professional ball in Spain. And while I was there, I uh, really had the uh, vision. There was a the war on poverty was in the United States at the time, so uh, our audience has to really uh, connect the era that I'm talking with with the uh, the attempt that we made to establish a community-based program because there were no community-based programs then. There were anti-poverty programs then, and uh, what we wanted to do was uh, do a, a, a program with community people given the, advan the advantage of uh, perhaps the college training that some of us had, to develop what we call the new paradigm at the time. And that was, and I think, is our greatest accomplishment. I think that the paradigm that we uh, focused on was the mind of the child. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this triangle, mm -hmm. the three sides of the mind of the child that we tried to capture within are on the one side, by law, our young people must be in school until age about 16, by law. If you're not, you're a truant, et cetera. On the other side, you have community-based organizations and service agencies like the Boys Club, the Girls Clubs, the PAL, and then CDOs, which were not in existence at the time, very effective. And on the bottom of that triangle is the family. And if that youngster is not engaged by any of those three sides, He's somewhere out here floating around in the street. So the paradigm was to develop that triangle. Inside of it is the mind of the child. And the dynamics happen at the points of articulation. When the school interacts with the home, when the school interacts with the community-based organization, when the home interacts with the community-based organization, et cetera. That way we have a constant information show flow. We have input, we have with input, and we have output, and we hope that that output uh, results in responsible social behavior. Now, you use the term sports foundation. Foundation means that you are raising money for a particular uh, Ely Mocenary public pur purpose. Uh, sports is the vehicle you use to reach these young people. So. Tell us a little about how you conceptualize using sports to reach the young people who we want to reach. Sports is the catalyst. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we did uh, 34 years ago, we did a needs assessment to see what our young people were actually doing in sports at a community base. And basically what we found our youngsters doing was basketball, mm -hmm. a little track, no organized activities for females mm -hmm. and that sort of set our tone set our mission and what we did was we used sports we did a different type format not just roll the ball out but we would have tournaments and if we had tournaments we realized that we had a schedule if we had a schedule that means that we engaged the youngsters for a certain p uh, period of time and as we did that we had other qualifying uh, 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 eligibility requirements such as you had to go to a class before you played the game and if you didn't go to the class you did not play the game and if you missed two classes you would be out of the tournament and someone else could replace you. Now the classes, what are the classes focused Those on? classes basically focused because uh, initially because our youngsters w could not take standardized tests mm -hmm. so we did the Manhattan 
and the uh, math and English uh, series of tests a at that time. Uh, one of the things that I always realized when I took tests as a youngster, mm -hmm. heck, I, you know, I got a grade, but I never got what all of the answers mm -hmm. were. So what we would do with our kids was we would let them see what they got, what answers they got correct, but more importantly, what answers they got incorrect mm -hmm. so that they would not be incorrect the next time. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, and, and we always had a co-ed program, co-education program, there were always boys and girls. Uh, as a result of that, and we, we speak on the sports, we do what we call the uh, uh, New York City Youth Olympics, in which we have martial arts, boxing, swimming, track and field, and a basketball are the major sports. We used to have paddle ball at one time, et cetera, but have boys and girls. We, uh, uh, and, and what we've done in terms of Sports Foundation, we have developed a program cycle, which is annual. During the poverty program, it was basically the long, hot summer, keep kids cool, and then when the winter came, everybody walked away and did their jobs. Sports Foundation's concept in 1969 was to keep it going year round. And we wanted the first programs to di do a program from a community base that was a year round program. In our program cycle, we have games such as the city game, which is the oldest postseason high school, ga uh, high school basketball game sponsored by a community based organization. We're going to our 33rd annual city game this year. And uh, that game started out as the best of the Catholic private school youngsters against the best of the public school youngsters, innovative in New York. At a time when the, when the schools had gotten kicked out of the garden, the public schools had gotten kicked out of the garden, there was no showcase for our youngsters, and we were very, very proud that we would be able to provide that showcase. We have the exceptional senior middle school and exceptional senior high school girl for women. Okay, so th that, that gives wom women an equal showcase. Uh, we've uh, done the, uh, we've been the inspiration for the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, which I'm sure we can talk about a little later. But those are the contributions I think Sports Foundation has made. How to many New youngsters York City. have you served in these 34 years? Just an estimate. Oh, Roscoe. What, I mean, four or five thousand a year? Oh, I, I would say uh, earlier more than later because the youngsters at that time, there were no programs, and we really served as the model for the programs. And we, we wrote a lot of, uh, we, we had a lot of uh, uh, tournaments and events for the youngsters. As others came behind us and, and imitated that, we didn't see the need that we had to do that, and we sort of kept on the innovation. And you did other things, like you've done counseling of youth who have substance abuse problems, have problems of adjustment <laughs> in school and the like which is another part of the Sports Foundation cycle. The, uh, we, have, we, we have what we call a, a prevention uh, program. Our program is a prevention program. Prevention uh, so, that they don't, so that our youngsters don't get involved in the substance abuse, that our youngsters don't get involved in the criminality that goes on. You know, we have a saying that we want to keep them on the basketball court and out of the criminal courts, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and such things such as that. Sports and drugs don't mix. Those are our themes and our slogans. But the bottom line is everything we've done is, is uh, geared towards prevention. Uh, we have a substance abuse uh, prevention program, which is supported by the state, uh, the uh, Office of uh, New York State Office of Substance Abuse Services, and we also have a, a, a program that uh, Congressman Serrano uh, was uh, uh, involved in, in terms of giving us earmarked money to uh, do stuff in juvenile justice. That's a, that has just happened in the last three years. So we've been out there 31 years without any real political support. When I say political support, I mean in terms of dollars. We've, we've always interacted with our elected officials, and when we needed things for advocacy, we always went to them, and we advocate for our youth. But the, but the big thing is our prevention program. That is always the theme of our programs. Now, <coughs> as uh, I understand you are going to step down as the governing officer this year. What's the future of the Sports Foundation? You're clearly, when you have a 34-year track record, you're there. But at the same time, when regimes change or when situations change, programs sometimes change. What do you see in the future for the Sports Foundation? Well, actually, uh, we, as I said, we have a pretty much a, uh, a, a program cycle that is almost on an annualized basis. 
and I mean, meaning the games, the exceptional senior, the city game, the youth Olympics, and and so special other special events that we have. But we also uh, have uh, always looking towards program initiatives. Now, uh, fortunately, I don't know if it's fortunate or not, but. Uh, my son came to me when I announced that I might be retiring last year at our annual dinner. Uh, incidentally, our dinner this year will be June 19th uh, at the Villa Barone Manor. And that will be sort of my retirement dinner, so I'd love to see a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the past from the foundation come there. But uh, uh, we right now are looking towards trying to build a facility you know, in the Bronx, because we've been out there with the uh, stick a long time and we've never had the carrot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we've always uh, taken the attitude that we are taxpayers, we have access to public buildings and schools, and that is how we will use our facilities in terms of getting, you know, our, d doing our programs and getting our ac a athletic stuff off. But uh, uh, I look towards my son taking a very major uh, role in the leadership in the future. I think he has a vision that he would like to see in terms of young people. Uh, you know, this is the hip hop society now, and I think that I, we'll see a little bit more of that kind of relationship in the foundation as we change over. I have a couple of young guys uh, and ladies there at the foundation that I look towards taking over the leadership, and I think that it'll be a smooth transition. Well, one of the things that you've done is to develop leadership through the foundation programs. Mm -hmm. Many of the people who've been through the foundation are in the sports administration, they're in the school administration, mm -hmm. they're into business as well. So that's the, that's the model that you dreamed of and the model really which has been implemented. The other thing that you have contributed to this great city is the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, why it's important and what it contributes to New York City given that there's so many halls of fame all over the country? Well, you know, first off, I think that, uh, you know, you asked about the, w the accomplishments of the foundation. I think one of the things that we uh, did was we were able to establish the whole notion that there is an athletic community in New York City, that there is a subculture that we call the athletic community. It's identifiable. And the way I can tell you it's identifiable is because any youngster who's ever played sports in New York City who has gone on to play professional sports, I could bring probably 10 guys to a table, and, and women, to a table, and they would have touched that youngster. We in the athletic community, that unofficial community, we actually uh, uh, nurture our our kids too. I mean when they're out of school, you know, you have more kids almost playing out of school now than that are playing in the public school league and the Catholic school leagues. Uh, that's number one. Number two, New York City Basketball Hall of Fame is a uh, a dream whose time has come. Honestly, uh, many people have said that because we've had so many great, great, great players who played in New York City. How does it contribute to the history of New York City? Well, the first thing it does is it lets people know that the Harlem Rens or the New York Renaissance were the first world champions of professional basketball, 1939 Chicago. Uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they, there were not many opportunities for blacks to play at that time, and a lot of those guys went on to play with the, the Globetrotters, who were in existence at the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, where, where you had uh, the, 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 the great Celtic teams, the Renaissance were beating the Celtic teams regularly. Mm -hmm. Most of those guys went into play professional ball, and a lot of, uh, of, of the blacks had to play with the Globies or play with other sort of touring teams. And, uh, and then ultimately our guys went into the Eastern League. I think that when you look at the inductees into the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, it, it uh, covers that whole era. You know, um, I think that, uh, you know, we have three categories in the Hall of Fame. We have players, we have coaches, and we have contributors to the game. And uh, if you really look, I mean, uh, the, uh, the trivia question is who's the first guy that went into the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame? Well, by just by, by the, the alphabet, Bob Cousy was the first one that went in. You had to, the criteria is that you had to have played high school ball in New York City. And as a coach, if you were from New York City and you got your fame other places, like Al McGuire, Al's from the city, but Al got his fame at Marquette 
actually. But he made a contribution there, and I was one of our Hall of Fame coaches. Of course, Red Arback was the first coach to go in along with Claire B. So we're talking about really great people in basketball, all who came from New York. And if you look at the roster, you will see many, many great players and people from all over the world inquire about these players now because they didn't realize that New York City had such, a, such an impact. See, in the 21st century, we more or less forget that basketball was just getting started in the early part of the 20th century. Yes. <coughs> being invented by uh, Dr. Dr. Naismith, James yes. Naismith at my alma mater, Springfield College, back in 1891. Mm -hmm. And through the first 20, 30 years of the 20th century, basketball was played in the settlement houses, on the playgrounds, in small gymnasia. Mm -hmm. and it was basically a city game, yes. which is what you call your, your classic. The high school game, yes. Uh, the first big opportunity for basketball to be seen nationally was when Madison Square Garden started their national tournament mm -hmm. in 1933. Mm -hmm. So that the game that we see today all over the world in arenas of 25 and 30,000 people in the NC2A Final Four was sort of a dream uh, in the late 1920s and early 1930s. So that, as you say, when the New York Renaissance, Hall of Renaissance team, won the first professional basketball championship in 1939 in Chicago, mm -hmm. that was a landmark. <laughs> yes, it because was. Because basically there were no integrated teams at that time. Segregation right. was still the law of the land. Right. And even when the NBA, which started as the Basketball Association of America in 1946, mm -hmm. was founded, there were no blacks. Right. The first black to play in the NBA was a young man I coached when I was at West Virginia State College, Earl Lloyd, mm -hmm. who just this month was elected to the Naismith National Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield. Earl Lloyd, first black, and Meadowlark Lemon, who was the comedian star of the Harlem Globetrotters, Harlem Globetrotters which was a team, that, and they called them Globetrotters because they played in one town after another, mm -hmm. and they added humor to the game mm -hmm. by rolling the ball up their arm, kicking the ball, spinning the ball, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, they had a white team that played against them, the Washington Generals, that mm -hmm. lost every time, every time because it was a show, it was an exhibition. But the Globetrotters were outstanding. And it was actually the Globetrotters and the Harlem Renaissance, the uh, New York Renaissance, that were the top two teams in the 1939 tournament. Mm -hmm. yes. And they put them in the same division so they wouldn't have an all-black final. Right. That's some of the history that you are carrying out through the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. Give me your impressions. You were a basketball player. You were a star. You were the captain of the NYU basketball team in the uh, early 60s. Uh, what is your reaction to seeing these two outstanding black basketball players, Earl Lloyd and Meadowlark Lemon, being inducted into the Hall of Fame in the year 2003? Well, first, uh, I'd, I'd say that you should be very proud to have one of your former players actually inducted into the Hall of Fame, Naismith Hall of Fame, and actually uh, uh, one of the first uh, professional black players. I think that uh, a lot of character is uh, instilled uh, at the college level to actually go through something like that. I, I have, uh, however, uh, three points I'd like to make. Number one, the first point is when you went back to the history of basketball, uh, they speak about, uh, they call basketball players cagers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a term that they use, the cagers. And I was always very, uh, uh, I always wondered about that. And I finally got a guy who uh, should absolutely, positively be in the, New York, uh, in, in the Naismith Hall of Fame, and that's Mr. John Isaacs. He's a former Renaissance. And he told me what that meant, and he showed me a picture. When basketball first started, they actually played in a cage. Mm -hmm. It was a cage which was a mesh cage, mm -hmm. and, uh, you, and, and it was a jump ball at every, uh, to, for, for the beginning of every point. And, uh, you know, they had plays off the jump ball and whatnot. But I said, John, but why'd they have the cage? And John said, well, because, Bob, sometimes the games got very physical, and it was interracial. And, you know, at that time, they didn't even want whites to fight blacks professionally. And uh, so, 
if they ever got got into a fight, they could at least keep the audience from jumping in on the cage. So that's the history of why they call us cagers. Number two, uh, with Meadowlark Lemon and Earl Lloyd going in, I think you know what you see there again is a tribute to the fact that blacks, Meadowlark going in, Meadowlark never played a game in the NBA. But the Globetrotters had to have extraordinary talent to take a ball at, from half court and bounce it and consistently put it in the basket or kick it in the basket. I mean, that takes extraordinary talent, you know, and, and dexterity. And uh, I think it's just an acknowledgement of where basketball has come from and that everybody does have a place in the game and should be acknowledged in the history of the game. And the third thing that I think we see today, uh, along with Earl Lloyd and Meadowlock Lemon going in, there was an Italian player going in. And as we were speaking before uh, the show, you uh, said that you had just seen where 20% of NBA players are now uh, foreign players. And I think that this was, uh, I think this is a direct contribution from David Stern, who has a vision to globalize the sport. Th th those are my uh, thoughts on that. Well, basketball sometimes is a whipping boy for the excesses of college athletics. Mm -hmm. uh, they change the transcript so that they can get people into college who are not eligible. They give them grades. They play for a year. They have an agent getting money under the table. They leave and make a uh, several million dollars, so much so that at the last uh, Final Four, they were praising the Kansas team and had two players that actually stayed four years. Now, this is a symptom of a larger concern in society. It has mm -hmm. to do with the role of education of poor people, underclass people, and people from minority backgrounds. Most of these athletes who are being exploited are from minority backgrounds. The question that I think about, and I know you think about, is what can we do to help change this? First of all, the Sports Foundation focuses on the role of academics. For example, in order to play in the city game, you have to have a certain average. Yes. You have to have a certain SAT score. Yes. So the Bob Williams of the world are making their contribution. But on the other hand, the big power brokers, sometimes they're college presidents who want to put the name of a college uh, on the map, mm -hmm. uh, they will do these things that are not necessarily positive. To take a young person and deny them the opportunity, not deny them, encourage them, to drop out of school to make some money is a problem. On the other hand, if uh, you have a young fella who's very good and he could make $7 million, the question is, why would he not? Mm -hmm. Which leads to a proposal that I've often made for years is that in the big time sports, they ought to pay the athletes a salary mm -hmm. and give them a contract without mixing the idea that they're getting a scholarship to get an education. If in fact, they wanted to get an education, they could do like the computer operators and the secretaries mm -hmm. and you go uh, at night, mm -hmm. go on Saturdays. But uh, what, what is your reaction to the, well, what I would consider to be a crisis in American sport? It, it may be that we have confused education with sport. For example, as you know, in Europe, um, most of the universities don't have teams. Right. Most of the time you played on them. Most of the towns have teams. Yes. So they, they divorce the sport from mm -hmm. the uh, athletics. On the other hand, the tradition of America is a sound mind and a sound body. And football and basketball and track started to help young men at that time mm -hmm. become stronger people with certain values. Those values are deteriorating pretty rapidly with every scandal that we have. So you've been there. You've observed this. I, I'd be interested in your reactions. Well, I think first off, uh, you know, we, when we started Sports Foundation, we had a, a, a saying, sports and education are one. And uh, I don't know if that is true anymore mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, whole aspect of, you know, strong mind, strong body. Uh, co-curricular activity, you know, uh, being the varsity or uh, co-curricular with the uh, intramural type program that you have in the school. And uh, what I have uh, seen is once the 
uh, like when I played at New York University, we had the only undefeated freshman team in the history of the school. We were 18 and 0. Within four years, the freshman rule was gone. There was no more freshman rule. I thought my freshman experience at New York University was very, very enriching because I got my first D and I realized I better tighten up on my studies, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I was able to see that the freshman year gave you a chance to get yourself oriented. You, we, we were not all over the country. We were all over the Eastern region, but we were not all over the country playing ball, you know, televised games that was worth several million dollars to the school and whatnot. We had a chance to get ourselves acclim acclimated to college. When I saw that they were taking freshmen and letting them play on the varsity in their first year, I realized that that was not in the best interest of the student, that it was in, be in the best interest of the school. Mm -hmm. And they were going to try to get as much money out of that uh, name cachet that was developed by this youngster through his talents. I also realized that the reason the school did it was to protect its investment because they realized that they were not going to have the youngster for four years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, these things were very strange mm -hmm. to me. And so I saw that in the end, uh, I think I agree with your thesis in The Black Gladiator, that a youngster, it's radical, but pay a youngster to come and play for your school, represent your school. And make no mistake that he's not a student. But the one thing that Bob Williams has taught through the Ford Foundation is the importance of values. Mm -hmm. You've just articulated the values of education, the values of character, the values of, of keeping your word. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. And you and the Sports Foundation should be very proud of your accomplishments over these 34 years. I want to thank you, Bob, for being with us on African American Legends today. And this little story, this little history lesson on basketball in America. Thanks, Bob Williams. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown.